Welcome to the TRX podcast, where we speak to leaders in health, wellness, and happiness to give our audience the edge, you know, in an ever-changing fitness industry. So today we're speaking with my good friend, Chad Foster, an author, a speaker, an avid skier, a dad, an athlete, uh, and we're going to learn really important lessons about resilience. So welcome, Chad. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate you having me. It's great to have you here. And here we are in the, the TRX HQ, which is great. So we want to give you know our listeners some of your background, but before I want to pull something to the front because it's really it's interesting. It's a great concept. Uh, the name of one of your chapters is "Excuses Are for Losers." Can you give us a little bit of the background, the mindset of what that it's a it's a powerful it's a powerful tool you use? Can you explain it? Yeah. So for a little bit of context, let me back up just a little bit and kind of explain how that how that came about. So I, growing up, you know, I lived a, a somewhat normal lifestyle, but at three, four years old, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa, which is an inherited eye condition, where they told my parents that at some point it was very probable that I would go blind. And I started learning the limitations of my eyesight by bumping into things as a child, learning that I couldn't see in dark environments very well. I went to the hospital so much that they actually separated both me and my parents into separate rooms and questioned both of us to see whether or not they were beating me. And the truth is they weren't beating me. I was just learning the limitations of my eyesight by bumping into things. And so that continued for a while. I figured out that I couldn't see well at night. And then as a teenager, as I started to wrap up high school and go into college, my eyesight began to fade during the day. Then at roughly 21 years old, I realized that everything that I had known up until that point visually was coming to an end. I had to get a medical withdrawal from my classes. I had to get a medical withdrawal from my major. I wanted to go into the pre-medical field to help other people. And then after going blind, you know, honestly, I wasn't even sure if I could help myself. So I switched my major to business, lost nearly three years of university work and had to figure out what I was going to do next. And I sat around wallowing in self-pity for a while. And I, I realized that that wasn't going to, serve, to, to really serve me anymore. And my dad had always told me growing up you know, my dad was sort of raised on a farm, had this tough love mentality, and had told me, man to man, people, you know, people genuinely care, but in the, in the vast ocean of society and humanity, you know, it tends to get swept under the rug. Like nobody really, it's not their problem if you go blind. That's your problem. And it's hard to hear that when you're going blind. There's so much truth to that, that it really resonated with me. And so as I was coming to terms with the fact that I'd never be able to see again, and I had to reset my, my academic career, my professional career, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be when I grew up, because certainly wasn't a blind person. That's not what I aspired to be when I grew up. I had to figure out what was going to fuel me. And I looked at the next you know, 50, 60 years of my life, and I knew I just couldn't sit around feeling sorry for myself for the next 50 or 60 years. Yeah, it's way too much sorry for any one person to, to live with. So I had to, had to adopt a new philosophy. And so I, I decided that in that moment, as I was dealing with all that, that that was the one that was going to give me the fuel that I needed to persist regardless of the circumstances. You know, I can't focus on what's happening to me, but I can focus on how I show up and how I attach my t myself to these circumstances and, and how I shift my mindset and deal with what's in front of me. Because at the end of the day, you know, none of us get to control all of our circumstances, but we have all got to be accountable for our lives and our outcomes. You know, it's your life. You've got to own it. It's my life. I've got to own it. If I don't own my life, who will? So it's one of those things. It's kind of hard to hear in the moment, but there's a lot of truth to it. And you were going through that as a young male, you know, coming out of your teenage years with all the stuff that goes on normally then, and then you're transitioning, then you get into the university environment. You know, take us through that, that, that part of it. You go from school then into the workforce. That's also a very difficult challenge. It, it was because yeah, I went, went to get my first seeing eye dog 23 years old, I came back and I had this really remarkable experience getting my first leader dog when I was there in Rochester Hills, Michigan, where I, I rolled in with this poor me mentality, but then I met people who had it far worse off than me, people who had diabetes, so they were on dialysis, people who had cognitive impairments, people who were deaf and blind, and so it really made me reevaluate almost instantly how I looked at my own circumstances. You know, I rolled in with this victim mentality, the poor me, 
uh, mentality. And then in a moment's notice, I saw very quickly, you know, how much worse it could have been. You know, I had over 20 years of eyesight, all my hearing, all my cognitive faculties. And so it just, to me, it illustrated how much I'd been given and it helped me focus on what I had, not what I lacked. And so I came back to university time I was attending University of Tennessee, had a newfound appreciation, new attitude, new perspective, and grades improved, made straight A's, made the dean's list. I didn't make anything less than an A from that point forward, made straight A's in my all of my business classes, and went on to work for a, a, a top consulting company, Anderson Consulting at the, at the time, now known as Accenture. Uh, but, you know, there was a lot of discomfort, even though I'd kind of come to terms with the fact that I, I couldn't see, and I, I'm a grateful for what I've been given, you know, I'm still rolling into university classrooms and job interviews and boarding planes with a big German shepherd seeing eye dog. And that was, uh, yeah, that, that took some getting used to. But the the gift in all that, I think for me was when I could see and my eyesight was fading, I was trying to, you know, pretend like I could see okay, trying to, you know, still see what I could see. I was sort of, you know, halfway halfway blind. And it's a lot easier to be totally blind than it is to be half-sided because, you know, with the dog, I walk in and everybody sees that there's a problem. I've got a visual condition. Something's going on. Something's unique here. And so no longer did I have to pretend to be someone that I'm not. I had to just be unapologetically authentic to who I am. I had to own my situation. And there was a, a real gift there because, you know, when you can't pretend to be somebody you're not, it forces you to be just who you are and, and own it. And that was a real gift. And then that helped me as I was navigating going into job interviews and boardrooms and all over, you know, traveling all over the U.S. and beyond with a seeing eye dog and being able to do that with the kind of newness that, that I was experiencing it. You know, cause I'd just gone blind about a year earlier, a year or two earlier. And here I am walking and, you know, learning new downtowns and new airports and hotels and client sites and all these things with a seeing eye dog, not being able to see, no idea where I'm going, how I'm, you know, not knowing how I'm going to get there, what the map of the place is or any of that. Um, but it, it kind of taught me that, you know, we're, we're, we'll all face fears, you know, and whatever we do, we're always going to face fears. But courage is not this sort of pie in the sky idea that there's no fear. I think courage is really, you know, stepping through the fear, sort of embracing the fear and, and moving beyond fear. Yeah. So when you think about your journey, right? So you go through that, you become a very successful tech executive. You do that for over a decade. And then somehow there's a spark to author a book, Blind Ambition, which I'm sure everybody who's listening to this is going to go out and they should go out and get it, uh, which is, you know, it's not just an inspirational story. It's really a practical guide that gives you tools to develop resilience, right? What, what, what audience were you trying to reach with that? Really, I want to help people who feel like they're stuck in their circumstances. You know, I, I want to empower people to not feel like they're stuck, empower people who feel like maybe they, they, are being controlled by circumstances versus being in control of their own destiny. And so what I want to do is empower people with the mindset shifts and the, the actionable insights that people need to take to break free from the circumstances that are, that are holding them back. And so, yeah, I talk about resilience. I think a lot of people talk about resilience in terms of, hey, you know, try harder, or don't give up. And those are both byproducts of being more resilient, but they're not all that helpful when you're in the middle of the change curve. And so what I like to do is help people understand what it takes to think more resiliently so that they can derive their own internal motivation to attach themselves to circumstances in a more productive way so that they can bounce back better off than before. Yeah, that's the, it's the beauty of the book. And, and also I've, I've heard you speak and, the, and what you're doing these days is really getting a message out to people. And what are the, uh, well, if, if we can, let's, let's unpack some of the lessons sure. learned in the book, right? Yeah. So the five pillars of resilience. I'll go through them. It would be helpful for you to just unpack each one of them. Okay. Choose your response. Tell yourselves the right stories. Visualize your greatness. Get comfortable in discomfort. Love that one. Yeah. Take advantage of your disadvantages. Can you bring those to life for us? Yeah. Yeah. So for the first one, choose your response. Essentially, you know, as, when I was at Leader Dog, as I mentioned earlier, I met these people and they had it far worse off than me. And that's sort of when it dawned on me that I didn't get to choose my circumstances, but I got to choose how I responded to them, how I showed up in those circumstances. And the great thing is we all have that choice, you know, to choose our 
response to choose our perspective and to choose our attitude towards a given situation, how we attach ourselves to it. So I like to think of it like a game of cards. And that's because you know, no card player ever gets to, to choose all the cards that they're dealt, but everybody gets to choose how they play their cards. And so the, sa the same thing applies in life. You, know, you don't get to choose all of your circumstances, but you alone get to choose how you play your cards. And being very intentional and very deliberate can allow you to separate yourself from your conditions. And then the second point, the second pillar, tell yours is just a pause for a second. So it's a little bit like going back to, you know, excuses, right? It's, you know, things will happen to you, yeah. right? And you can either use it as a crutch or you can use it and just decide you're going to, you know, overpower in some way. It's very purposeful and intentional. Yeah, I mean, we're we're fortunate. We get to have the uh, the the opportunity to pause and think and decide how we're going to respond. You know, being human, we we have that capacity. We're we're able to kind of separate ourselves from the emotion. I think the the natural tendency is to have those negative emotions, and that's fine. And it's it's fine for those negative emotions. It's normal to have those negative emotions. Where it becomes nonproductive is allow that to become rumination and for that to dominate our airwaves all the time. And so how do we be very intentional about how much airtime we choose to give those negative feelings? You know, can't just turn them off, but we have to make a conscious decision how much time we're going to allow them to be present. And then at some point we have to decide, all right, is this how I want to live the rest of my life? And I decided for me, you know, this is, I, I can't live the rest of my life like this. It's just, it's too much. I have to figure out the next, the next best step. That's right. So you, Next one, tell yourself the right stories. Yeah, to, to me, this is really the heart of resilience. And so it's the idea that the stories we tell ourselves about a situation are far more important than the facts alone. And so looking at my situation, you know, the fact for me, unchangeable fact, I went blind in my early 20s. And essentially, there were two stories that I could have told myself. Story number one is that I went blind because I've got incredibly bad luck. Or story number two is that I went blind because I'm one of the very few people on the planet who has the strength and the toughness to overcome that, and I could use it to help other people. Now, technically, both of these stories are true, but the first story paints me as a victim. And the second story, the better story, is a Jedi mind trick that transforms my disability into my strength. So it, it says that I went blind because I'm mentally strong enough to deal with it, which, by the way, means I'm mentally strong enough to deal with all of the other curveballs that life will throw at me. So it's called cognitive reframing. You know, that's the science behind it. And it's essentially the foundation of resilience. But it's this idea that the stories that you tell yourself about you and your circumstances will determine what happens in your life. Because I'll promise you this, every single one of us will become the stories that we tell ourselves, whether it's personal or professional. So you have to be very intentional about the stories that you choose to tell yourself because at the end of the day, you will become those stories. Which is the, the beauty in that, then it leads to the next one because you tell yourself that story, then you visualize your greatness. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the tongue in cheek way I talk about this is I had to figure out how to make blind look good. And it's, it's like, it's a little, you know, it's a little tongue in cheek. Oh, you get away with saying that. Yeah, well, <laughs> but it, it's so true, right? If you can't figure out how to make an unfavorable situation work for you, how could you ever move towards acceptance of that situation? And so I had to visualize greatness in blindness. And it's really hard to wrap your head around that in the moment. But if you, if you can never take the unchangeable reality that is your existence and somehow reimagine a future with that unchangeable reality, grounded to that unchangeable fact, but actually inspiring enough to motivate you to take action, you won't be able to find the energy or the motivation or the inspiration to do the hard work to change the things that are inside your sphere of influence. So when I'm doing a workshop for a corporate team or whatever, I'll talk about there are things that are outside our sphere of influence, like blindness, and things that are inside our sphere of influence, like learning how to give a keynote or learning how to lead a workshop or learning how to write a book or you know take an audience through a, a particular message. And so all those things can be learned with enough focus, effort, and determination. The thing that I cannot change is the blindness. So how do I, how do I take that unchangeable thing and reimagine a future that is bold enough and inspiring enough to motivate me to do 
the hard work that I need to do to change the things that are inside my sphere of influence, like, you know, getting a, getting a good job or having a successful corporate career. Right. Uh, and then that, you know, that then leads into, uh, like I said, one of the ones that really resonates with me, get comfortable in discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. To, to me, this is really where mindset meets action. So it's one thing to have the right mindset and to think you know, strategically about how you're going to, to attach yourself to circumstances, but really if you don't have action and it's at that point, it's just a hope or a dream. And I'm not into hoping and dreaming. I think we have to have plans and actions and habits and, and wrap those, those actions and habits around it. And for me, honestly, I think I'm at where I'm at because so much of my life has been an experiment of living outside of my comfort zone, you know, going blind, learning that I, I couldn't see at an early age, bumping into stuff. Uh, it was physically uncomfortable. There was the emotional discomfort of not being able to do a lot of the things that I wanted to do at night. Socially, it was uncomfortable. Walking into job interviews with a seeing eye dog and uh, navigating all over the world with just me and my trusty seeing eye dog was uncomfortable. But then it became so normal for me to be uncomfortable that I started craving discomfort. And so I, I took up snow skiing at 38 years old, where I you know, often ski black and sometimes double black diamonds. And then at 45, almost 46, I decided, you know, it's a good idea for me to pick up Brazilian jiu-jitsu and maybe I should go compete in a tournament for that. And, and so it's, it's one of those things where if, honestly, if you're never getting outside of your comfort zone, then you'll never grow because that's where life begins. Life begins outside of our comfort zones. And, you know, comfort zones to me are complacency and nothing really good comes out of being complacent. Yeah, and I want to talk about your fitness journey, which includes your your jujitsu journey. Uh, but let, let's let's hit the fifth one. Yeah. You know, take advantage of your disadvantage. Your fifth pillar for resilience. Yeah, I think here every disadvantage, every perceived disadvantage that you think you have in your life, can serve as an advantage if you use it in the right context. So if you look at my situation, my blindness for me, obviously it has this you know perceived disadvantage with it, but. It, it did give me some advantages. You know, when I was doing my job as a technologist, as a pricing uh, lead for these multi-billion dollar deals, my blindness forced me, I had to write code to connect my software with our spreadsheet system and with our enterprise systems and all the tools that we use just to be able to do my job. So I had to learn how to be a software engineer just to do my job, which made it easier for me to understand the technology solutions that I was selling to our clients because I had a better technology understanding. And so when I needed to do things from a deal construction standpoint, or even from an operational standpoint, how do I put the deal together using all the different, very advanced spreadsheet systems that we used? I automated a lot of that because I was intimately familiar with the backend object library because I was a technologist yeah. because my blindness forced me to be. And so every perceived disadvantage gives us some advantage if we just use it in the right context. So those five pillars, you know, as I said, it really is that practical guide, which is terrific. You also, you have an interesting view on happiness. Yeah. What does happiness mean to you? Well, it's, it's not this fleeting feeling. And to me, it's, it's not an emotion. To me, it's a decision, a perspective, something that we make every single day when we wake up. Because none of us get to control everything that happens to us. So if you, if you put your happiness precariously outside of you into sort of the whims of life, these circumstances that you can't control, you're leaving the most important thing in your life, your happiness, your well-being, your, your sense of fulfillment precariously outside of your control. So I believe it's a decision that you make every single day when you wake up. You either choose how you're going to look at things or you allow random circumstances to affect your happiness. And for me, you know, my happiness, my well-being is far too important to leave it at the hands of chance. So I just, I feel like it's a decision, it's a choice, a, it's a perspective that we have to make every single day. So maybe what most people think of happiness, I think of as joy. And I think happiness is a is more of a, a formula. You know, it, it involves some joy, it involves some hard work, um, it involves overcoming adversity, it involves growth through discomfort. And, you know, it, to me, it's more about the fulfillment that we get from from doing some of the things that need to be done to improve ourselves and, and continue to grow. Yeah, I love I love your perspective on it. You know, I've been focused on health, wellness, and happiness. And I think about it as an aspirational goal in many ways. But when I heard you talk about it's not an emotion or a feeling, it's a decision. You know, I go back to my mother 
talking about the Bing Crosby song way back in the day, accentuate the positive, yeah. eliminate the negative. That's intentional happiness. Yeah. That's making it, you know, b- making that that decision. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your fitness journey. You've been you've been an athlete, you've been a beast. You and I trained. Uh, we rolled yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so I know I've been on the mat with you. Yeah. You are a beast, a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. Uh, can you talk about what fitness has meant to you along the way? I don't know if I would be where I'm at without fitness, if I'm being totally honest. I think when I was going blind, I started uh, I started sports at three or four years old playing soccer. Obviously, I could see then. I started lifting weights and becoming a gym rat at 14, 15 years old and training regularly, whether it was you know through basketball or, or football or soccer or I wrestled in high school. But when I was going blind, you know how it is when you're, you're training and you know, day, there are certain days, especially when you're a kid, you don't want to train. It's hard. It feels like a grind. It's like, okay, do I really want to go today? And the mental discipline that it took to get through those days, because I would, you know, I'd do five, six days a week. Sometimes I'd do two a days, those five, six days a week. Uh-huh. When I was going blind and I had to deal with kind of relearning everything and the, the discipline that it took to ground myself and and push through that, I think was really informed by my fitness journey. I don't think I would have had the mental toughness to navigate that situation had I not been training physically. Because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who maybe t- don't train as often think physical training is all about physical. And to me, that's sort of the byproduct. It's it's mental. It starts with mental. You've, you've got to have the mental fitness to do the physical work and they feed off one another. And so it really helped me navigate my situation and come out the other side of one piece. Yeah, and then, look, we share a love of jiu-jitsu. You got into it in your mid-40s. Uh, I got into it in my, my mid-50s. Yeah. Uh, so I think we'd both encourage everybody to give it a shot because- Absolutely. What I tell people, if it's for you, you'll know right away, and, and it has the potential to change your life. And you know what was fun when you and I rolled, uh, I think you've also found fitness as a parenting hack. You, your daughter, Juliana, yeah. right? She, yeah. she rolls with you. It, yeah. what, what a beautiful way to spend time with your kids. And I it, and I rolled with her. She's very technical. She's very yeah. so you're training her well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. She's she she makes us proud. You know, I I got into it honestly. I wanted to just be able to spend some time with my kids doing some activity because I can't teach them how to shoot a jump shot or you know catch a ball anymore. But I can show them how to throw a leg triangle or an arm triangle or or whatever because it's all hands on. You don't have to be able to see to do it. And so I started it really just wanting to be able to spend some time with them doing some activity and all of us just fell in love with it. It's one of those things we've got in our blood now and just can't get it out. So we're, we're there as many days as they're open. My professor gives me a hard time. He's like, you know, not nice of you to show up eight days a week, Chad. I mean, <laughs> if they're open, I'm there. And if they're not, I'm trying to bring somebody to the house to, 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 to do a session that, at my place. Well, I, I think I mentioned to, to you and, and your wife, like, you know, I was impressed with you before with all your accomplishments, but after meeting your kids, I have to tell you, take it to a whole new level. So well done. Thank you. Uh, great job Thank there. You, um, so you've also, look, a lot of people have a difficult time. You were in that really successful corporate exec role. A lot of people have a hard time making a transition out of that into something that's scary for some people, yeah. going to become an entrepreneur. Yeah. You went from successful tech exec to an entrepreneur you know, you're, you get speeches all around the world. You're an accomplished author. Can you talk a little bit about that? What causes you to decide, okay, now's the time I'm going to go off and do that? What drove you to do that? I think for me, it was, it, for me, I knew it, it just, it felt, um, it honestly didn't feel like I, I had a choice because I knew it, it was what I was supposed to do. So I don't do those things, the speaking and the the book and the coaching and all those things. I don't do it for work. I do it honestly because I feel like it's what I was put here to do. It feels like a call in to me. It's my purpose. I, I honestly feel like for me to come out of my situation in one piece and, and better off than before, statistically, is kind of an improbability. You know, how did I end up better off blind than when I could see? How did I end up happier blind than when I could see? And the only logical conclusion that I could come to is that I'm supposed to do something with it to help other people. And that became obvious to me when I was elected to speak at our graduation at business school, where I had a moment that just completely changed my life when a guy comes up to me and he's like, he's hugging me and telling me about his daughter that he had lost uh, the year before to, to cancer. And that was one of those moments that you'll never forget. It's just, it's impossible to forget 
the impact that I could have on somebody like that when I wasn't really, it, it never occurred to me that my story could be that helpful because I was looking at my story through my lens, not through other people's lens. But when I saw how powerfully it could help other people, I just couldn't forget that. I couldn't ignore that. It felt almost negligent to not do anything with it. And so that, you know, moving beyond me and focusing on how I could help other people gave me the courage that I needed to step through the fear and, and do the real scary thing of the hard work of, okay, let's look at a new business. Let's look at learning a new craft. Let's look at how I can reach and connect with people and empower them to, to not feel restricted by, by their circumstances. So I think for me, that's what it was. I think the, the net of it was, you know, focusing on something beyond myself, you know, looking beyond my career, looking at other people. That really gave me the inspiration that I needed to, is, is to move beyond me and stop looking at how how it affects me and focus more on how I can benefit other people. Well, I'm, I'm glad you are. You're, you're a powerful speaker. I, I, I've been kidding around with people. I had the horrible experience of following you on stage at the Lifetime Sea Otter Classic event. Right. Uh, large audience. I just got up right afterwards and I said, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be thinking about what you just said because everybody's hung on your words. And I know the, and I gave the audience free permission so they didn't need it. They were going to do it anyway. They were going to keep thinking about what you just said while I was up there. But uh, it was, it was actually, it was, it was terrific, but it got us to get to know each other. Absolutely. Which is fun. So you, your ability to embrace new things and, and just drive to just reach out and grab new things is really remarkable. That also is, it's, it's inspirational. Now, got to ask, you got hands on the TRX suspension trainer. I did. Right? I did. So in your fitness journey, how do you, how do you think about that tool? Well, I, I, for me as someone who like, I like to exercise every day if I can. And some days it's harder than others, depending on where I'm at in the world to be able to take a gym and put it in my backpack and set it up anywhere I go. It's like a Swiss army knife. I'm, I'm really inspired now to see how I can take my fitness journey with me, no matter where I'm at in the world. I was talking to you earlier. I've got you know, gigs coming up in Singapore and Dubai and all over Europe, Milan, Madrid, Paris, Sao Paulo, uh, all over the States, everywhere in between. And to not have to worry about, hey, can a blind guy find the gym in this large venue? Is the gym open? Where's the equipment? To have a tool like that, that I can, I can master and set up in something as simple as a hotel room and be able to get my workout in, you know, 30, 40 minutes, whatever it takes, get a stretch in, all those things, and carry it with me at all times. And I, I, I'm certainly not a professional, but I learned enough yesterday to be really dangerous. So I'm excited to see where this is going to go. Uh, that's great. Well, it's great to have you on the journey with us. Well, Chad, thanks for taking the time to come in and join us. Thanks for bringing the family in to meet our gang here, too. I appreciate uh, and, and just thanks for continuing to inspire the world. Thank you. Appreciate you having me, Jack. Thanks.